Kia ora and welcome to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod in Te Wiki o Te Reo Māori or Māori Language Week. No mai, haere mai, e muri mai e tahi tukinga nui, whakaharahara i te mutunga wiki e nui nā ko papakororo. Kai taku taha ko ke tahi crusader, kapa Māori o mua, ara ko Bryn Hall no o te tahi, me te tahi no te kapa kahrangi, Kai te kape, no te kapa o pango, no tamaki, a James Parsons. E kāre mā, pai te kemu whitiporo e tērā wikinene. Ha, kā pai, here here ake, e nei e tahi o ngā piro. So what we said there in uh, Māori language, because we look to further strengthen and normalise the language through our show, is with me is Bryn Hall from Christchurch, our Crusader in Māori All Black, and James Parsons, former Blues and All Blacks player. So we look to get into a big week of breaking down the footy. What did you say, James? I just said, hello, guys, and how good was that weekend of footy? Uh, then I said there were some epic tries, and I can't wait for Jipper to to go on about Bowden Barrett's epic foot pass. So I look forward to hearing a little bit more about that. <laughs> well, why should we wait? Let's just get straight into Bodie. Huh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> he stood out again. Toki Toki Cow, Bowden Barrett, he stood out. Was this his best performance for the All Blacks since 2016, 2017, Jipper? Oh, it was pretty, it was pretty strong. Uh, the, the parts of this game that I really liked... Um, was his depth control um, of his attack. Like when he got that quick, fast ball, he was flat and to the line and took advantage of that and, and running through uh, between defenders. But also he popped up on that short side a lot and he held his feet a number of times, which created space for guys in and around him. So he manipulated the defenders really well when it was on slow ball uh, and it wasn't just a performance off fast ball as well. So all in all, pretty successful. And, and I, I think for the most part, um, they kicked really well and put themselves in, in great field position. Uh, you know, obviously, especially in that first half, I think they had something ridiculous like 70% territory and possession. So, um, you know, they, they were in the right parts of the field, probably not as accurate as they would have liked in that first 30 minutes. Um, they would have liked to have taken a few more opportunities, but he certainly uh, made every post a winner when he got that ball in his hands and setting up a number of tries. I was watching uh, the Matrix um, new teaser on the weekend, and then you watch Bowden Barrett perform, and you think like these two things aren't too dissimilar. <laughs> he, he was pretty. He was pretty special. I mean, that pass was was incredible. But the whole um, that whole try, uh, you know, the, the the quick tap, the willingness to play, the fact that guys like Dave Havili, George Bridge, and Rico were ready to go. They were on their toes um, for TJ to pull trigger like that, and then. Obviously, for, for Bodie to finish it the way he did, but you know, you've got to acknowledge the the work rate of uh, Luke Jacobson as well. You know, he's he's charged up the field there, probably not expecting to get that pass, a, a flick, cutout ball <laughs> that was perfectly on his chest. Um, but uh, it was that, that whole uh, sequence of play. I think um, sort of showed the best of the All Blacks. Um, you know, from deep. You know, eight of their nineteen tries have come from their own half, and that's what's making them so. Uh, powerful because if you want to protect the backfield or you want to switch off uh, like they like they showed there, they can quick tap or they can pin you on the edge if you're covering in that backfield too. So I think that's the thing I'll be most impressed is how how many tries they've scored from their own half and they continually to do it. What do you think of that, Bryn? I mean, the tactics are varied. They've got the ability to play multiple styles from any part of the field. They're looking pretty good. They're building well. Oh, look, I think the attacking, the attacking side, you can see the difference in, I guess, the competition, a flow and effect, and you watch the Australian and the South African game. The Australians had to had to change their game style a little bit more, but look, we'll go and we'll dive into that a little bit later. But now, look, I thought um, the attacking brand that the All Blacks played with was was great, and I think even the likes of Asafa Moore, who I thought was fantastic in the, in the contact area around getting it over the advantage line real early on, and, and had a great... You know, forty-five odd minutes before he went off and uh, really set the tone physically around the around the um, the running the running carries. And I thought Scott Barrett was again outstanding. Um, his interplay between contact is is world class. You know, he had the great ball carries going over the line with his footwork, but his ability to be able to interplay with the tip balls and hitting the balls in the inside really let the the All Blacks go forward. Because I think in that first thirty minutes, um, the Argentinians really held on with some courageous defence. Um, Great tackle selection, I thought. You know, a lot of them were trying to hold the ball up, slow down their ball with stack tacklers. 
and then at the same time actually defending for multiple phases to 10 to 12 phases in that kind of 30 minute period and then you know you look at that probably the 37th and 42nd minute um the two tries at the uh, at the back end of those of those halves due to the the tackles that Argentina Argentina made you know they made 133 tackles in that first in that first half and I guess you know the real killing of that game was you know that try just before half time so um yeah the All Blacks are, are real clinical but I think there probably is one work on that they probably would, would want to have they had 18 turnovers um so they did have a lot of opportunities in that first 20 minutes and didn't get the points that they did deserve but again they were just uh um firing up more so just shots after shots after shots and it almost felt like i don't know jipper for you but it just felt like they were going to break and you know back into that half time i thought it was a pretty uh, pivotal time for the all blacks to really cash in and then um in the back of that second half just due to the fact of how many tackles the argentinians made um it made them really hard and then they started ill discipline and giving away penalties and the all blacks kind of um, flew on from that as well with the jakes some tries in the second half yeah, look, I think the simplicity of the All Blacks' attack off set piece was was awesome. You know, like a good strong carry from Sevu for that first try, quick ball, Bodhi between defenders gets an offload, and you know, uh, fortunate that it bounces up and, and Rico scores. But that's because of the pace and nature of their clean out allows them to get on top of a side because they can't get back on defence and they're sort of backtracking and, and it's just it's it's not overly um, hard foot footy. Well, it doesn't look hard, but it's actually harder to execute than than you think. And, and even when um, Rico went through on a short ball from um, Jacobson, again, just a simple line-out, cut-out pass, tip ball, uh, guys just running straight and square into holes. I just thought there was a real simplistic edge to them uh, in attack and, and their clean-outs. Um, and, and you mentioned Scott Barrett. I thought Scott Barrett was um, outstanding. I thought both um, him and Brody had, had massive nights, um, really, really made a mark physically and and did the tough did the tough stuff, you know, Brody probably more so defensively, getting a couple of turnovers and I think in that first half Scott was touching the ball so much, really working well off his brother uh, at first receiver there, which was which was great to see. Um, but with them, you know, sort of interplaying, you spoke about giving those tips and inside balls, that's probably the one area I think they'll want to rectify because we saw it against Fiji is when they get that disconnect and they make a little bit of a penetration that they, the cleaners get caught up. And, and the RG's got a couple of turnovers. I think they got eight turnovers at the breakdown um, by that sort of disconnect. So sometimes it's fool's gold getting those passes away because it can put you in trouble if the cleaners uh, can't get in behind and react. But all in all, um, pretty successful night um, attacking wise. Mm. I think one thing also as well, Jip. Um, you know, you talk around the attacking prowess of the All Blacks, but you know, defensively, you know, to have zero. To have zero points scored against you. We talked about last week around the pick and go through the middle where the Australians found a lot of pay with Samu and Kiribi in that game. And you, you look at um, and the, the, the attack, even though the likes of, um, of Sanchez and even the outside backs tried to, p- to penetrate through the middle, you know, there was really no uh, way to get through. And due to the, obviously, we talked around last week that there wasn't, you'd probably see a shift in that kind of defensive mindset. And look, when you can have zero points scored against you, against, you know, yes, the All Blacks did have a lot of ball and they, they, they dictate a lot of the play. Um, it's it's a pleasing aspect knowing that you know what's going to be you know, probably in a fortnight's time against similar men that have similar physical prowess when it comes to the attacking of the ball and um, the the attack as well. You, you, I sp- spoke about Brody's turnovers. It's it's almost the simplicity in their defence structure as well was successful. You know, everyone's going low for those chop tackles, which gets the uh, attacking player to the deck so fast that allows that second guy arriving uh, the ability to attack the ball. Brody got a couple. Uh, Tokiaho got a couple when he came on. Papali'i got a crucial one uh, just before half time, which led to a try. So again, they're, they're, they're you know they're not looking to um, always stack or always be dominant. The the guys doing the chop tackle are, are getting so much pay out of it because they're getting to deck so quick. It's allowing their teammates that access, and and again that sort of disconnect that I was talking about on the flip side, they're being able to execute when they're on defence. Yes. Yeah. Just before we do move on, Ross and Yas, I thought also another guy that I thought played tremendously well um, was TJ Pedernada. You know, I thought, you know, he had 99 passes and we talked about, um, you know, the difference between him and Brad around quick ball. Look, I thought that's the quickest I've ever seen TJ get to the ball. So, you know, the trainings that Nick, that Nick Gill and the coaching staff to be able to put a lot of their players, not only TJ, but, you know, you look at the guys that have come in and it just seems like they're hungry, ready and uh, haven't, haven't missed a beat. So, um, look, I thought he was outstanding in the fact Probably that first 20, 30 minutes uh, really got the ball out, was trying to get the ball going to tempo. And I don't know if you saw Jip as well, but, you know, the All Blacks wanted to 
play a lot of um, quite early on going to the switch back play, being able to use the um, going back the switch play and being able to attack that, whether that be a kick. Um, you know, they probably would have thought maybe 50 22 opportunities as well that you maybe saw early on. But um, look, I thought TJ then um, opened up his game around all array of skills around the heart defense and you know, interplays with Sebu and even Brody Retallick uh, around that heart defense and then um, the tempo as well, the, t- the quick taps, you know, for the try of. Um, when Bodie gives that ball to Jacobson, I thought um, he was outstanding on the weekend. And look, we um, talk about competitiveness around that, that, that position, but look, I thought um, TJ was, was outstanding. I thought he was a, just a notable mention with throughout um, a lot of All Blacks that played well in that, in that test match. I think he'll think um, his numbers one to eight, you know, because if you get good, fast, accurate cleans and simple sort of targets, it means that ball's going to be fast and you've got access to it. And because they provided that platform and allowed him to really shine and show his you know, triple threat game, which was great to see. And, and I agree, I thought he was massive and, and made a huge statement, as, as did Brad Weber when he came on as well. I thought he made great imp- impact as well. So there's certainly a lot of competition in that nine jersey at the moment. Let's touch on TJ and Bowden and Quade Cooper, three of the absolute standouts of Sunday. All of them have just finished playing in Japan. The, the tom- common thread there is that that league actually prepares people for test football pretty well, Bryn. Well, I, I look at a, a halfback in particular. Um, you know, that in the Japanese league, it's really based around your tempo and being able to get the ball out as quick as you can. So, you know, probably like to think TJ going over to Japan probably lost a few kgs around trying to get to the style of what it was to play in Japan. And um, from all reports, when he played out there, he was um, obviously at his physical prowess and been able to impact the game with his running game and, def- and defensively with his turnovers and his a- actual physicality. But again, I think his tempo was 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 seen on the weekend. And, you know, that's probably him being in Japan and, and being in a in a league where tempo is probably the is the king in that in that, in that competition. So, um, and then even Bodie as well. Um, you look. <laughs> I thought he was again. He, he took it to another level around his. You talk around his game management it was great around even his his types of different types of kicks that he had. Um, his, and even and even and even in the, probably the last two test matches, his long distance kicking as well has been a real attribute and a real great as, um, positive for the All Blacks in the last two test matches. And so, you know, he's coming back into form. So I think the only thing that you really try and get used to, and even with the likes of Brody as well, is probably that physicality of playing against um, you know bigger bigger players you know the Japanese is a little bit different around like I said with the tempo and probably being a little bit more agile and fitness whereas it probably it might take a little bit longer for that physicality what to, to get used to it and I thought the All Blacks have done that really well with Bodie Brody and TJ bringing in them slowly um, with with getting a bit of game time here and there and then now they're getting into a position where they're starting due to the the conditioning from obviously Nick O'Gill uh, Nick Gill and um, obviously the coaches as well being able to give them the confidence from going from limited minutes to then be able to play in, in 80 minute games or more minutes in, in, in the games. I think you could you could add Michael Hooper and Samu Karevi to that list as well. They've obviously come from Japan um, and I thought they were exceptional um, on Sunday as well. But if we look at all those names, the other thing that sticks out is they've been around a long time. They've been professionals for a long time. So they know what they need to get themselves to that absolute peak performance. And, and they're certainly right in the mix of, in, in all areas at the moment. The Tiaratu headquarters of the Luke Jacobson fan club, which is here behind me, um, was an extremely happy place last night. Um, <laughs> such a physical presence, so good with ball in hand, so good on defence, so much. But despite all of that, when you look at the loose board makeup right now with the way that Artie's playing, Dalton's playing, and Akira's playing, it seems really unlikely, Jipper, that there's any chance that Luke Jacobson can bust into that number one um, triple threat of the scrum there. Yeah, oh, look, it's definitely a tough area. And I think it's it's an area that we've spoken about all year, being a tough area to select, even when we started off early in the year against um, Tonga and Fiji. So it, it's, it's a continuation of that discussion. But what's important is every time one of these players it's getting an opportunity they're taking it you know you, you mentioned Aki you know Dolts and and um, Artie are, are playing really well and, and and playing you know the house down but Luke comes in plays 80 minutes and and is you know there's obviously the tries but it's actually the work he does off the ball um, his defense you know his ability to you know work I suppose himself into positions to be an option to score that, that try off the end of 
Bodie, so you know, he's playing extremely well. I thought Blackadder gave a good injection as well. Uh, so mm. it's certainly um, a, a hot topic, and and I think you know they'll they'll keep rewarding um, the the guys that they've chosen and stuck with, and and then I suppose it's about freshening up in styles and and potentially. I think you might see he, he will be able to get some more minutes, especially when it comes up against the bigger sides. This weekend, though, against the Pumas, Bryn, what do you think they'll do with their loose forward mix? Yeah, it's obviously dependent on what what Artie is as well. I um, mean, you know, obviously Artie had that had the head concussion, and so you know he could be coming back, especially with what's to come with the, with the South Africans and being able to put him on the field, you can always go back to him and um, give him, given that he's obviously the captain with Sam being away and Sam's going to be continue to be away for the, for this, this test match. So Artie can always jump back in there. And then you look at Akira, you know, Akira's played three test, test matches on the bounce. So, you know, he's one guy that could, um, could be rested knowing what's ahead with the South Africans and how many minutes he has played. And then you give Jacobson an opportunity at six or, you know, possibly even Blackadder knowing that Jacobson's played 80 minutes. So, um, and even, we haven't even talked about Hoskins to Tutu. Who last year, you know, came in leaps and bounds and been able to be a real um, weapon at number eight as well. So he's a guy that hasn't had many opportunities. So it's another guy you could put in there. So it's a real competitive environment in that um, All Black um, loose forward trail. We've talked about it a lot in the in the in the, in the series before the rugby championship, and you know, it's it's a continuation moving forward because what they are doing really well is you know the likes of Luke Jacobson when he gets this opportunity, he's playing really well. A kid is playing consistently really well with the amount of minutes that he's playing. And even, you know, Ethan Blackadder didn't have that many minutes. But, you know, when he came on his injection and be able to do what he needs to do to stake a claim to get more minutes. So, you know, as a coaching group, you're absolutely stoked because it doesn't matter how many minutes they are playing or when they are get given the opportunities, the men that are playing are ready and they're taking the opportunity. So um, the All Blacks in a really good spot. And I think the Argentinians will be a lot better um, come the weekend, so um, they won't be resting on their laurels at all. They'll be, um, you know, wanting to rectify those probably those eighteen turnovers of, and how many opportunities they had in that first 20, 25 minutes, and um, you know, moving towards a better performance as the All Blacks always want to do. They always want to be better and um, keep improving, knowing that the South Africans are just ahead. Mm, and especially with Crema and Matera there, it's a pretty good preparation for the South Africans. I mean, even last weekend's performance against two outstanding world class loose forwards, Chipper. Um, it, it's a good preparation. Oh, absolutely. And you saw um, in moments that those two players you name and um, Kremer and Matera, you know, stand out, you know, around the breakdown, um, around some physical carry, some defence. But I think, you know, Argentina will look at themselves this week and, and sort of almost similar to what the Wallabies the week before and, and, and realise they're their own worst enemies. When you're giving away 18 penalties, 20 minutes without um, 15 men, it just hamstrings you and, and, and it's something that you can control. You can't just keep giving away penalties. I know they, they fought tough for 30, 35 minutes, but there's only so much defence you can do before you do actually tire and, and, and it saps you and, and you know the, the team that's been on attack eventually does score when, when the execution's right. So I think they'll be looking at themselves around their skill execution, but more importantly, just their discipline. It was the same when they played South Africa. It piggybacked um, the Springboks down the field, and, and we saw how um, good their maul is again on Sunday. So um, it's an area that they'll be wanting to rectify because if they do that, then they're a fairer chance of being in these games and giving themselves a genuine opportunity to win them. Mm -hmm. well, we saw the defence. We saw a little bit of their set-piece prowess, but... Bryn, where else do we need to see improvements from this Argentine side this weekend to make it so it's not another drubbing? Well, to be honest, I think what Chip says it's really important. You know, you look at the All Blacks when we played Fiji and we gave away so many penalties in, in that game. You know, you saw Sam Whitelock with how disgruntled he was around it because it's so hard to be able to get your, your game going. And I think, especially with how the All Blacks are in their form at the moment, you know, if you're going to give them opportunities time and time again, you know, the All Blacks were in the inside the 22, meter, um, 22 metres of Argentina for almost 10 minutes and had 22 entries into the 22. So, you know, you look, you give the All Blacks that many opportunities with the form that they're in, they've got to be able to rectify their discipline, um, especially things that you can you can control, you know, the ones that you, you can control as yourself as an individual look. You know, set piece wise, you know, you might have the odd, a couple of scrum penalties due to the dominance. Uh, the lineup more might be functioning really well. Um, you know, there's a few side entries that they did, 
Um, but you know those those little things that you can control. You know you can those are the ones that you yeah you pat your head on and thinking you know those we can make that a lot easier and not give the All Blacks opportunities because with the attacking prowess and the ruthlessness that the All Blacks are going at the moment, um, they need to be able to uh, suss out that discipline. Um, and then you know they had splashes on the weekend. You know even for the previous test when they played South Africa for that last couple of minutes they were you know up tempo offloads flair getting out inside the line and playing off the cuff kind of rugby and that's when the Argentinians are at their best. And so the more opportunities that they can play with the ball in hand, get the the likes of you know Sanchez going to the line like he did a couple of times um, early on in that, in that passage and ask the, the the questions of the All Blacks because if you if you don't do that and you tackle all day and you give away penalties, um, you're not going to be able to have any any go against any team in the world, let alone the All Blacks in the form that they're in at the moment. Mm-hmm. I just want to go back to the form of Bowden Barrett. Can you describe how hard it is, Bryn, to be getting hit on one side by a tackler? to be able to throw a spiral offload from under the arm for 15 to 20 metres and hit the man right on the mark. Like, how just how mm. difficult is what he did in that pass? Yeah, I'll tell you all, mate. For someone that's a fundamentalist like myself and doesn't have that much flair like uh, Bodie, I can't really comment on that, but um, I'll give it a go. Um, now, look, he, he's, you know, he's world class. You know, that's one of the reasons why he was nominated two times best player in the world because it's, it's things like that. That um that nobody else in the world can do. You know, it was a twenty meter pass right in the bread basket to Jacobson, and you know you probably almost looked like he was um, a little bit surprised with the ball coming. But you see the the pure joy of all the players. You know, his brother Geordie turns around, and there's a couple other players around Bodie with when he did the pass because they knew how special it was. And so, um you know, you keep giving a guy like that an opportunity, and you know his running game was on the back of that. You know, the times where he played nice and flat, and some really good opportunities. Through the quick ball that the that the ball that the forwards gave him, it was the ability to play flat at the line, and you know we don't even touch on his ability to be able to kick to Geordie Barrett. You know we talk about the pendulum, uh, not the pendulum, the the playmakers, the ten and the fifteen. Look, I think Geordie and and Bodie are playing really well at the moment, just more so instinctively and in seeing the space that they're both seeing at the same time. You know the little um, crossfield kick that Geordie almost scores, um, it just went dead, and then you know, there's a little grubber that he put in behind with Geordie, and it just bounced the other way. So look, I think. All in all, Bodie's playing really well around his, his running game, his kicking ability and working in tandem with that kind of 15. So when Damien was there with Richie, you know, they worked really well. And the fact that Geordie's been given an opportunity in the last two test matches, bar one, he got red carded. But, you know, the influences that he had on the weekend working with his brother, um, it's a pretty good it's a pretty good make at the moment. They're going pretty well. Is that a trained thing, Jipper? When you saw Bowden at, at practice at the Blues, is he spending extra time doing those kind of things, just working on? I mean, there's a million skills that you could do like that that you, you probably never use in a game week by week. Yeah, he certainly works on um, plenty of skills, but he does do a lot of things that to us appear freakish um, instinctively. Um, you know, whenever we were going 15 versus 15, some of the things he'd pull off were. Yeah, exceptional and you sort of stand and you, you, you're shocked by it at the time. You're like, holy heck. Um, and, and I think this is no different. I, I think he just knew Jacobson was there and he had to get it there somehow and, and did it the best way possible with a miracle flick pass. But he, he I suppose he believes and trusts his skill set and his prep during the week to allow him to do so. And, um, you know, I, I agree with what Bryn was saying. I think across the whole back line and, and across the game drivers, um, their option taking at the moment is so mm-hmm. clinical. Like it's almost ten out of ten. If, if you look at when they decide to kick, it's on. When they decide to run, it's on. And that's why they're having this ability to attack you in their own twenty-two, middle of the field, down um, in their twenty-two. They've they've got a game plan and a and a way and a style of play in each area that can put teams under pressure. And whatever defence pitcher the defence gives them, whatever the team. Uh, playing gives them they'll find out where the space is um, you know even Dave Havili put it on the boot um, good long kick down the middle of the field Geordie decided to put one a little grubber um, so all those sorts of decisions um, you know they just add up because it puts the pressure it's where the ball needs to be um, and I think you know Bo, that takes a lot of pressure off Bodie so he can just play what he sees as well and trust the communication in and around him and, and they just seem to have this seamless flow um, from from 9 to 15 at the moment and, and the guys that are making the impact off the bench. Mm. And 13, Rico Ioane still looking so incredibly dangerous. Is he the most dangerous outside back in the world right now, Bryn? 
Oh, look, he, he definitely is. And, you know, you've got to almost give a, a more pat of a pat on the back for Rico, the fact that, you know, Anton Leonard Brown was injured and, you know, you, you know, we don't know, obviously, the stories around how late that was and they might have, Rico might have had more opportunities through the week to get more um, game time around understanding being a centre, knowing that he's going to be on the bench. But look, for a guy to be able to come in seamlessly, and it seems to be like a lot of the players, like I've said to you, when they do get an opportunity, whether they're playing at the start or coming off the bench, um, they're making the most of the opportunities. And look, again, he, he topped, you know, one of the top running metres in, um, in the All Blacks and um, his distribution is, 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 is great as well. And that's been a massive flow on um, with his improvements in his game and defensively as well. There were a couple of times he, he backed his speed to be able to get up and put line speed pressure on on the Argentinians. And again, it's it's working with Davy and you know the Davy and even I thought you know Seva and George don't underestimate what confidence they're giving George. They're sorry, they're giving Davy and Rico with them playing high and having the two guys in the backfield and all working as one because you know they're making really good decisions and it makes it so much simpler. Chip, you know, as a sensor or if you're a forward out in that edge position, whether you're a tech off, off, off strike ball or on phase play, having that confidence from those guys and giving the communications in from the wingers and the guys in behind to give those guys opportunities to go up, um, it's helping them all. And it seems like that's the, the, the positive at the moment. Everything's in tune. Everybody's doing their own role, nailing their own job, and everybody has been able to have their own instinctive rugby and making plays like Rico's doing on attack and, on attack and defensively as well. And considering all of that, does that mean that Sam Whitelock not being available for the rest of the rugby championship isn't maybe as big a deal as it might have been before because this team appears to be gelling no matter who's on the park? Yeah, look, I, I think that's one of the most amazing things at the moment is the depth that's getting tested and, and I suppose the new leaders that will be um, getting grown at this level. Uh, if you if you look, you know, Artie's out, um, Whitelock's back here, Richie Moonga's back here, Aaron Smith's back here. You know, it, it's it, it's creating an opportunity for other guys to step into that space and grow, and then that can only harness them and put them in better stead going into twenty twenty three. And I know it's a bit early to be talking about that, but look how well they're doing. Like they, they, they seem to just be, you know, really happy and um, tight team, and that to me shows that you know the coaching group's got them really humming their leadership groups has got the, the, the boys engaged during the week, but obviously having a good balance between work and play so that they can go out there on the weekend and just express themselves. And I think that's the most um, exciting thing coming out of this tour so far is how much their depth is getting tested and then how much every player that's getting an opportunity is just stepping up and almost going, well, I'm, I'm just as good, if not better, in these roles and, and I want to be staying in this jersey and it's going to have to be earned to be given back to the guys that we're used to seeing them. And I think I think those guys will um, relish that opportunity and that competitive edge as well. Mm. We talk about the All Black depth. What about the Wallabies depth? Quay Cooper, it had been a million years since he had played a test match. Um, he hadn't been wanted by the Reds and was discarded. It's been on the outer picked up a Japanese contract and then all of a sudden out of the blue he's in the Wallaby squad Dave Rennie's shown faith in him giving him some time and then boom we see one of the coolest fairy tale comebacks in modern rugby Bryn what did you make of Quade Cooper's performance and what in particular did you like Oh, look, I thought, um, you know, it's goal kicking first and foremost. I think that was, you know, the pretty pretty pivotal and especially against the South African teams that, um, that that don't give you a lot defensively. So you've been able to get your points. And I think previously, the last couple of times they had played the All Blacks and it was mentioned on us and even over in Australian media as well around squandering the opportunities that, that they did have. And, you know, I thought the fact that they did get the points when they deserved it due to the, the kick of... Um, of Quade Keeper's boots, a lot of those points, but you know, I thought the opportunities were taken a lot better from from last week, and um, and I thought even his touches as well, the Callaway try, um, you know, the, knowing that the South Africans have a lot of line speed, it's it's their depth, and you know, Tim Horn actually talked about it, being able to have a little bit more depth, knowing that those you know those defensive line pressure is going to be coming at you, and given the you know, there were two runners for the Callaway try, he gave a nice pass to Karevi, the two runners outside uh, outside of him. Good touches like that, and Krivi obviously uses a bit of footwork and puts Callaway um, around for the first try. But you know, I look back in the previous his tenures, you know, you'd probably say he's due probably two or three mistakes in, in a game. 
knowing that he's probably going to try too much. He's going to do the, the offload or the, the step or the, the little kick or something that, that puts his team um, in a bad position. But I couldn't name any mistakes or bad decisions that he made on the weekend and putting his team under pressure. So, you know, that comes back with his maturity and they, they, they talked about it a lot on the on the, the commentary for the Australian the Australian team, seeing his, his growth around his, his game management and um, doing some really good things around some good game management and not giving those opportunities to the other team. And, um, and look, we talked around um, the goal kicking. Uh, it was a massive um, negative with, with Lola Sien. You know, he'll learn from that. But, you know, whenever you can have eight out of eight and have a winning goal, to win the game, um, it was a very great fairy tale, and you saw Sonny Bill with how happy he was, uh, and you sort of seen the pictures of him smiling and chahooing, um, seeing his mate get the get the game winning goal. For me, I, I think what um, I liked the most was his composure under that line speed mm. pressure, um, because it would have been so easy to chance his arm or try and push the envelope to to make a statement, but he took the risk out of his game the whole night. Um, and they had a clear game plan, obviously, that they wanted to build points um, via the three and, and not, not risk too much. But you mentioned that first try. There was a lot of times where he didn't pull trigger because of that line speed pressure. He felt it and mm. he just tucked it and he took the hard carry. Whereas in the past, mm. I think you would have seen maybe a bridge ball or um, something, you know, maybe a chip kick or anything like that. But he just he really took, pulled the risk out of it. Any turnover ball... It wasn't, you know, looking to spread it wide or anything like that. They kicked down the field. They played that territory-based game. And that's, in the end, really what won them, is, is they just didn't give um, the Springboks that much to live off um, their mistakes. We spoke about it last week. If they can control themselves, they will be in test matches and give themselves a genuine mm -hmm. chance. And it, they limited their errors. The only thing they will want to work on is their penalty count because that's what gave the Springboks the end. They got the high penalty count of 17, three tries off the back of Malls. So if they can control that this week and they put that same risk-adverse game plan together with Quaid's control and, and, a, and his positive nature to playing down the other end and getting the ball in front of his forwards, I, I, I think they, they should be excited about it. And I don't think it should be underestimated, Samu Karevi's um, performance. I, I thought he was even better. Like, he was great against the All Blacks. But he was just exceptional um, on, on both attack and D. Um, and, and I also felt the impact of Nick White. I, I really thought he brought some real control um, and, and some you know, you know, focus into that second half. So with that said, Cooper 10, Karevi 12, Ikitao 13. Is that a solid combination for the future for the Wallabies? I mean, can you, can you lock that in for a little while? Well, I think, I think yeah. That, so you can... Go. That 13 will be um, competitive, and so will 10. I think Karevi's the, the, he'll be the nucleus, the one that is probably the most permanent. But um, 13 and 10 will, will uh, I would say, are up for grabs, and, and the person who wants to take it um, will, will get it. You know, we've got Paisami. They've got a, they've got a lot of midfield talent um, that, that has come through. We haven't even seen Parisi yet. Um, you know, we, we know... Um, Hunter's really destructive in a, a 12. I've been a big fan of Vicky Tell, but you know it, it, it will be a position that probably is up for grabs. But going into this week, you can't imagine they'd be changing too much of this squad after a performance like that. Um, I, I think the one area they will want to rectify, though, is their mall D. Uh, because yeah. if they can find a way to stop that mall D, that, that is going to be another um, nail in the coffin, I suppose, because it's just, man, it's impressive. Um, the Springboks' ability to just score try after try, and, and they just keep coming. It's not going to go away. You know, if if they get um, pulled down or sacked, they're going back to the corner, and you're going to have to stop it one way or the other. So, you know, I've spoken about it before, but you look at the 2019 uh, pool game of the All Blacks versus Springboks, and watch Kieran Reid's ability to sack. They just stayed down. They didn't overcompete, and they just pulled it down straight away. It, it's seriously a ploy they might need to look at. Or a game they can potentially go back and watch and, and pull something out of it. I think Chip, there was one thing that I really did enjoy um, from from the Australians. We talk around set piece parity and playing the All Blacks with the likes of you know even Whitelock and the likes of Retallick and Barrett, the amount of pressure that they do put on. You know, I thought the Australians' variety 
was really great on the weekend. Even, you know, they wanted to have off the top ball. They had malls. They also had a bunch of players going to that transition zone. So they must have seen some, some big weaknesses around the, the, the spring box because they went to that transition a lot with some great ball carriers from Corobetti and especially Karevi to get over that advantage line. So um, do you think that would just be another way that they want to try and manipulate and keep that high success rate of that percentage of being able to win line-out ball? Well, they had that set piece parity, didn't they? And that was a, yeah. one of the areas we see crucial going in. Um, I think they ran at ninety odd percent at line out time. The scrum basically won them the game after that big, big shunt and, and enabling the, the turnover to get the penalty. Uh, so I think they had a massive night at the set piece, and, and it will have to be even bigger because you know it was a strong performance. But when you look at it, three tries via more, That's that's what people probably remember. So. Uh, keep up the work on their side of the ball and winning their ball and you know the, the work they're doing at scrum time but somehow they've, they've definitely got the power there because they're, they're showing that power as an eight as an eight man pack at scrum time so it's just finding a system that's going to work and gives them the ability to you know stop these rolling malls because it's it's a hell of a weapon yeah You'd imagine that they'd be going straight to that through this week because the South Africans didn't necessarily show a lot more. Bryn, a lot of ball kicked away, not a lot on attack in comparison. Um, you know, if Australia can shut that particular area down, you'd be pretty confident. Well, look, I think South Africa, they were pretty clear around around what their plan was. And, um, you know, Khaleesi talked around after the pre after the post-match, talked around they didn't take their opportunities and they weren't as clinical as they were in that and that Lion series, you know, and look, you go through a Lion series, which the, it's, it's massive high intensity and they're at home. Yes, there were no people, but, you know, the familiar surroundings of being at home play, plays a factor. And look, it was the first time they've been on tour since 2019 down here. So um, they looked a bit rusty in that sense. And, um, you know, they implemented the game plan around, you know, that first 10 minutes, they didn't change a lot. I thought their, their kick chase was, was, was good. Um, you know, again, that's going to be their game plan going forward and the likes of Mapepe, um, you know, got some, some ball back. But look, when you don't get the the parity around the points, when you do get them deserved, you know Pollard miss. You know what are they? Were they rocking out fifty percent? They miss four kicks, and so when you don't play a lot and you get behind like they did against the the, the, the Australians, um, yes, their line out more was great, but you know they had zero clean breaks and two offloads for eighty minutes. You know, so yes, they are going to have their way of playing, being able to kick ball, um, be able to build pressure through that way, and they'll keep continuing to do that. Um, but I think, you know, the ability, when they do have the ball in hand, they've got to be able to ask questions. And, um, you know, we've talked about it a lot, you know, in that Lions series. The reason why they played so well is because they were getting the points accumulated from the time when they did get down to the half, whether it be the 22 with the likes of Pollard, ticking over and getting, you know, that's 12 points that they could be scoring. And it's a different story when you're when the game's close and you're not chasing that much. So, um, yeah, I think they'll, they'll sew, sew in that up a little bit and they tackled at 83%. You know, the Australians will ask them a lot of questions, so... You know, we talked around the they were operating at, operating at ninety percent uh, through the duration of that British and Irish Lion series. So um, they'll have another week in camp. You know, they'll go pretty bone deep around their um, analysis and preparation for what's to come because um, they're a proud country and you know there's a lot of things that they can rectify. But again, you take the positives. If you're going to give them opportunities to have line at malls, um, good luck at your you know good luck to the Australians because look, you have three tries. It's a massive weapon. Yes, the Australians will go away and try to rectify that and be able to stop it. But look. It's a massive uh, strength that they have. Uh, but, you know, there's probably the other parts of the areas around their kicking game and then the points that they do accumulate through that pressure of not playing a lot. Uh, they need to be able to get points through the penalties um, and scoring more points that way. Yeah, look, I don't think they need to panic, to be honest. Like, they've got the game plan there. We've seen it. But I, I don't know how you saw it, Bryn, but I felt like their kicking game, they weren't as contestable. They didn't bring mm. um, their, their wingers into the fight I suppose it was almost clear air for the for the wallabies just to take them and, and counter attack back and that was that was one of their biggest strengths is getting in the air making it a 50 50 making it a bobble ball and then potentially scoring off the back of that so I, I don't think they yes. need to change too much like I, I, we've spoken about it before so it's a game plan that works for them and um, they just probably mm. just I felt like the kicks were just a little long and didn't allow them in the in the fight. Um, because the other areas you, you mentioned is the first time that potentially the defence um, was was sort of taken apart a little bit, uh, but not massively. One try, um, so it certainly um, wasn't wasn't too huge. But I suppose their penalty count allowed um, Australia to to get some scoreboard pressure, I, I suppose. But 
Um, yeah, I, I think the nucleus of, of, of their performance is there. They just had a, probably a, a rough night in terms of the execution. Mm. Yep. They haven't won in Australia since 2013. Um, you know, you've seen the All Blacks went over there. We've seen other countries went over there. Why do the Springboks struggle against Australia or in Australia, Brent? Well, it's the, it's the fact of having home advantage, isn't it? Um, and so, you know, it's, 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 it's no different from um, when the All Blacks go to, to South Africa. And yes, we've been successful, but it's, 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 it's different. There's a different feel. Um, obviously, the, for us going up to the Velt is, is a little bit different around your performance and being able to prepare for that. And it's, it's just different. So, um, you know, they haven't been able to be away from home. They've been away from South Africa for the last two years. And look, they won't use that as an excuse. You know, they knew they, they would have prepared well. They've had a great... British and Irish Lions series to be able to prepare physically for a game, but um, they won't use it as an excuse moving forward. But, you know, Australia are, are a proud country, and whenever you get to play home fixtures against a, a crowd, they talked around, Khaleesi said it was great to see a crowd and, um, you know, trying to play in front of people. You know, they won't use it as an excuse, like I've said with, um, with, with traveling, but things that are different compared to what they have been used to in probably the last 12 months. So, um, it's no different from when Australia comes to New Zealand. We've got a great record at Eden Park and, and in New Zealand. And the Australians seem to have a great record against the South Africans when they do travel um, to Australia. The Aussies have a pretty strong record against the, the uh, All Blacks as well, you know, in Brisbane and Perth. So, uh, look, they, they definitely lift a level. And, and I think it was one of their you know, more clinical performance and, and more most disciplined performance to stick to their game plan for the whole 80 and, and they got rewards for that so um, there's there's that aspect um, and potentially they like the style that South Africa play against them they probably feel that it works for them to play against as well mm. now one of the most interesting things I thought out of the weekend was Nick White's 5022 obviously he's become a pub quiz question um, you know, plenty of people might <laughs> win a bar tab off him in years to come with the first 5022 in Test Footy. But along with the 5022, and when you consider the amount of short grubbers we've seen in behind the lines in the last few weeks, it seems like those two tactics and the way that they mix being an outside or outside back or a full back, Bryn, is going to be far more challenging to know where you need to be um, because there's mm. pressure on you in all sorts of places. Well, there is, but I think, you know, you look at probably the All Black system and how New Zealand team, how the New Zealand team um, defend. When you've always got two in the backfield, it's, you know, it's really hard to get the 50-22. So you probably think, you know, that was the first 50-22 of the championship because having those two guys in behind um, gives that security better able to take away those opportunities to kick it in behind. So there is space, and you saw Quade Keeper do it actually, kick in the middle to where the sticks is because that's where the, where the space is due to the two guys in the backfield. But... Um, look, I think it was a great heads-up play from, from Nick White. He saw that um, LaRue was on the other side and um, went back against the grain and puts it in, into that corner. And so Fafta Klerk is, is really good at that. And, you know, I'm a little bit surprised that, you know, you haven't seen him. You have a little bit more 50-22s. He did do a couple of kicks that did win out that went inside the 50-22 metre zone. But he's another guy that I think has a really good ability seeing that heads-up play and seeing where that space is. But like I said, um, the difference, you know, from, from probably five or six years ago when there was one patroller one fullback just patrolling the whole field. It's a little bit harder now with having the two guys in behind. So the one that I did like around that uh, with Nick White is that, you know, when you do have the 10 and 15 back, the 10 starts in the front line. So he does. it takes him a bit of time to be able to drop back. So if you do want to have a look at the 50-22, if you can get that 10 in that, in that tackle or just be able to be close and then kick off that, that's when you have the ability when there's only one in the backfield. So um, you might see more more teams. It's happened a lot in Mitre 10 Cup, or the, sorry, the Bunnings NPC. A lot of teams getting 50-22s around that, knowing that it takes the 10 a bit of time to get back, or even off uh, click attack. You know, the, the South Africans early on had the box kick, they'd get it back, give it to LaRue, a two pass, and then LaRue would kick from that. So those are the kind of opportunities that you will see with the 50-22, and I think um, coming forward you might see a little bit more. But like I said, especially with the All Blacks, with how they defend, and most of, New Zealand, or most of world rugby at the moment, with the two guys in the backfield, it's a little bit harder to get those 50-22s and the space is actually in the middle of the field where the, the goalposts are. Let's have a look to this weekend. Uh, where do you see the wins going this weekend, James? Oh, look, I, I think um, the All Blacks will continue on from that form. I think they'll come up against um, a sterner test. Uh, you know, the Argentinian boys will do their work and 
um, come out and, and, and want to rectify a few things. But I, I think um, as we spoke about that depth and growing that depth in the All Blacks, um, whatever 23 they put out there, um, there's definitely a confidence in that camp. But making sure that they just do stay on the job because you can see, uh, you know, we were talking about the Springboks, um, you know, last week and, and how confident that they must have been. If, if you just take the foot off the throat or you're just, you know, five or ten percent off on the night, you can, you, you know, you can lose test matches, especially at this level in this uh, rugby championship with the quality sides. But um, you'd have to think the All Blacks will uh, be clinical again and, and get the job done. And, and I think the Springboks will bounce back. Uh, it's nothing against. Australia, you know, like I, I think, you know, it hasn't really been touched on, but if you if you watch Cooper's uh, winning penalty, you watch the two guys that chase the hardest and are underneath the sticks when, when um, you know, everyone else is celebrating with, with Quaid. It's Michael Hooper and Samu Karevi. You know, to the final minute, those two boys are leading the chase line just in case it doesn't go over and it, you know, it ricochets just to give themselves an opportunity. So uh, the, I just thought they had a great night. They've been led really well by those two two guys and, and Quaid. Um, but I, I just feel if the Springboks can get back to that game plan that we know they play, but executed a little bit better with more contestables, um, a little um, few, uh, little less penalties, um, and and a little bit more accuracy in their rush defence, uh, I, I think you'd have to think um, they'll they'll come back with with a win. I, I don't I don't see them. Going um, this whole championship without a without a win. Bryn, for you. Yeah, I think it's going to be a continuation for the All Blacks, and I guess the more the topics, what well, to start the start of the week, we'll be seeing who's going to play because you know the the All Blacks are are playing some great footy at the moment, and a lot of men are putting hands up to be able to you know you look at the back end of that season and what's to come. You know, the hundred Test matches is a game that you want to be a part of, and then. Another go at the South Africans uh, with her, with the last two years not being able to play against them is is not too far away. So um, you know the positions of who's going to be able to play will, will be interesting, and it's guys like us that will be consistently talking about it on our WhatsApp and seeing who's going to play. We already know Ross, you want Luke Jacobson at eight, which is fine. But we'll continue <laughs> to keep talking about that through the week, and then I think the South Africans Daily. as well. They'll they'll see the South Africans will bounce back. I think. Yeah, look, I think the efficiency around their defense, which was so good around the British and Irish line series, around that 90, 80 to 89%. I think they rectify a few things and been able to um, you know, put a lot more defensive pressure on the on the attack of the Australians. But in saying that, the Australians continue to attack. They continue to have the ball. from Even against the All Blacks, they have the position and the territory, and it's a continuation for them to be able to keep playing into their game plan to like what Jip said. You know, been able to have a look, have a few phases and have a have a go, but then understanding around what that might look like with your contestables off Nick White or, you know, Tate McDermott, not too sure what his injury was. He went off early and in, in the, in, came off early after that second half, so not too sure what's going to happen around him. But then I think um, the South Africans will, you know, they won't give away two, two, um, two yellow cards, penalties, and they'll continue to keep going to their kicking game and going to their set piece, which was which was evident on the weekend. So, but I look, I look to see the South Africans will bounce back. It'll be, it'll be a tough encounter. It's going to be a real tough encounter with a bit of confidence that the Australians will have from that, from that victory. But you know, I see the world champion, the world champion team for a reason, and I think we're going to see them bounce back with a, with a lot of vengeance and a lot of, a lot of passion as they always do as the South Africans are national team. That should be a lot of fun. It was great fun watching two big test matches in a row like that. I'm yeah. looking forward to doing it again this weekend. How good was that, Jipper? Oh, it was outstanding, and this weekend we've got some Bunnings NPC too, so I'm, I'm frothing. I can't wait for the rematches this weekend. E taria, hikakatia, ana na, tuarua tanga, hae te mutanga, iki nei. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much to Bryn Hall in Christchurch, of course, James Parsons in Auckland, another outstanding episode of the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Tēnā koutou e whakatata mai ki tā tātou hokata Hey, Tiwiki Hoki, Aotearoa Rugby Pod. See you soon.